And now I would like to give the floor to our guest from Sweden, Mr. Joran Lindblad, who is currently the president of the Platform of European Memory and Conscience. The platform was established last year, just uh, and just one week ago, there was the first Congress of the platform members where important decisions related to the future activities were discussed. I would like to say a few words about Mr. Joran Lindland, who, uh, who has been a member of the Swedish Parliament for quite a number of years. He was heading the delegation and was the vice minister as well as the chairman of the political affairs and uh, active uh, contribution of Mr. Lindblad in the field of human rights has contributed to European processes in terms of restoration of historical uh, justice. And uh, due to his activities, the principal position turned into a resolution due to condemnation of the crimes of totalitarian regimes on the European level, which was a very important document adopted in 2006 that has the number 1486. We are greatly honored to have Mr. Joran Lindblad here with us today and we hope that he will inside with his he will share his insights during the event. Thank you very much for those uh, kind words Ronaldo. Uh, and it's very difficult to come in now after uh, these distinguished and very high qualified speakers. Uh, and also, uh, I wear my glasses, Emmanuel, so I don't know what excuse shall I have uh, not being able to, to read my notes or, or, or whatever. Anyway, I'm happy to be here at this very important conference because this work that we have to do together must go on uh, for a long time because we are relying uh, on the history. We can never get away from the historical past. We must always live with the memories and we must use the memories in order not to repeat uh, the mistakes. Last week, uh, before the platform conference in, in Berlin, we had a meeting in the old Stasi prison in, in Berlin, which is now a museum, but still a terrible place. Uh, we had a very good conference the day before the platform meeting also, uh, where the theme was, uh, what can Europe do? So it's about the same theme as we have here today. And, and I answered that question with, with two words, everything or nothing, because there is a whole lot that can be done and too little is actually done, even though there have been very many initiatives now in the European Parliament. And also uh, the initiative of the European Parliament and the European Commission to use the terminology totalitarianism is a welcome news because then we can deal with all totalitarian regimes and all totalitarian crimes, whether they are based on national socialism, based on communism, based on fundamentalistic uh, uh, Islam or based on whatever ideology, uh, they are still totalitarian uh, crimes done by totalitarian regimes. I always, during my work uh, on the report in 2006 and also now later get the, the question, do I compare the National Socialist Hitler regime with the Communist Stalin regime? And I say, no, we don't have to compare and we shall not compare. Each totalitarian regime must stand on their own terrible merits. And this is very important because we have to go, go, get away from this comparison between who is worst. For the one single person sitting in a, in a 
in a cell uh, with uh, water torture or whatever torture or being shot or even only uh, penalized by the, by the system, for that individual, they don't really care what ideology is behind. So we must judge the, the crimes according uh, to the records of, of the criminals. And this is really important for, for, for the future work. And therefore, it's also uh, important that we talk about totalitarian systems. In an earlier speech here, uh, Timothy Snyder's book, Bloodlands, was uh, mentioned. It is a very important publication, and I also recommend everyone to read it. It deals mainly with those parts of Europe that were occupied and terrorized by both the communist system and the national socialistic system. Uh, and a lot of people were killed under the uh, different ideologies in, in these territories. It is not easy for a lot of uh, Western European politicians to understand the situation in uh, countries that have been occupied when they have not been occupied themselves, or if they have politicians in the countries that are defending one system or the other. And for example, the, the Greeks and the French said that, oh, our communists are good. Well, that was only because they never got absolute power. Uh, and the same goes for, for uh, nationalistic forces. We have in, in the Swedish parliament right now a nationalistic party that are very close to national so socialism, but they're trying to, to hide it. Their, their main uh, object of, of uh, hate today is, is mainly immigrants, no matter where they come from. Uh, and, and this is uh, something that has to be exposed. And we cannot expose these things unless we look back at history. The same goes for, for uh, communist or socialistic parties that are still active, that we must remind uh, the young generation about the, the crimes that has been done in, in the name of this and that ideology. A lot of argument goes that, oh, well, communism was a good idea. No, it was not. That went wrong. No, it didn't go wrong. It, did, it went ac actually according to plan. And this is the terrible thing with it. If you have a, an ideology which is based on, uh, on the statement that you should use terror in order to keep a dictatorship in place, nothing good can come out of, of, of that system. So it's already in the books. The same goes for national socialism. You can read it in, in Hitler's Mein Kampf what terrible crimes would be the outcome of, of, of this system. And same goes for other, other regimes uh, today. Emanuelis mentioned uh, Harry Bu. You probably didn't remember his name, but that, yeah, welcome to the Alzheimer Club. I forget names all the time, but Harry Bu, I, I do remember. He, he's a, a hero in a way because he fought against the Chinese communist regime, but he was totally wrong in, in that conference. You and I, I agree on, on that, and, and therefore I, I come back to that, uh, that we shall not compare. Instead, we shall try to bring justice to the victims. And this is one important uh, topic for the platform at the moment. We had a conference in June in the European Parliament uh, they were sponsored by Sandra Kalniette and, and Mr. Pettering was there speaking as well as, as the um, latest EPP president, Mr. Busek, was also there. And we discussed, is it possible to bring the communist perpetrators to court? Very many of the Nazi perpetrators have been brought to justice, which is great. Uh, and there's still a few alive that are now still found, but they're, they're dying off quickly. Uh, but there are a lot of communist perpetrators still at large in many of the European member countries. Bulgaria is a terrible example where they had, had um, uh, a lot of terror against the Turkish minority or, or in the mid 80s, just before the fall of, of the communist system. And I'm sure there are uh, perpetrators alive in this country and, and the other two Baltic states as well. And it is important, even if we cannot uh, give economical com compensation to all the victims or their relatives, that we can give some moral compensation. And therefore, we have to investigate, is there a way to find a common European court, 
to try these perpetrators because 20 years have passed and <clears throat> there have, in very few countries there have been court trials with, with communist perpetrators. It almost didn't happen. In, in Germany you had some trials uh, regarding the border guards that, that killed people at the border uh, and they were sentenced according to East German law actually but not very much else has happened. So we have uh, appointed a small commission of, of uh, a few lawyers that are now working together with the platform to try to find out if there is a way to set up a court. Our belief is that it should be an international European body and maybe the only way to do it is to set up uh, a coalition of willing three or four European countries joining up together and, and form a joint court. And I, I'm hoping very much for the Lithuanian chairmanship in, in the European Union that this can be pushed a bit forward and, and we could recruit a couple of other countries to be interested in this and see if, if some work can be done. The issue of Russia was brought up here by several speakers today and, and I agree, Russia is a key key player when it comes to come to terms with with history especially of course the communist past but also the the nazi past I'll, I'll come back to that when i did the research for my report to the council of europe i went to an archive in in moscow and on the wall in the archive people were there the archives are partly open they're very little open not every files are open so so they have to be open much more but there, it's possible to go there and do some research and, and there were uh, civil Russians sitting in there and in the big hall, big study hall, there were two pictures of uh, Lenin and Marx on the wall looking down at the poor people looking into the communist crimes committed to themselves or, or their relatives. Can you imagine in, in, in Berlin, I said this last week also in Berlin, can you imagine having a picture of Goering and Himmler looking down at the people at the Nazi archives? I cannot. It's sort of outrageous. It's intimidating those that have been victims of crimes to have perpetrators sitting in a, in a position like that in a, in, a, in a painting. If I come back to the role of, of Soviet Russia when it comes to, to Hitler's crimes, without, without the pact between Stalin and, and Hitler, the so-called Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact and the division of Europe, crimes of both regimes would have been different or they would have been more difficult to commit actually. Because w without his back freak, Hitler could not have attacked uh, West Germany, uh, West uh, Europe the way he did. And, and uh, the division of Poland and the division of Europe into spheres of interest between the two dictators made it possible for them each to act on their own without uh, having problems with the other one for a while. My, the, the <coughs> also, this, the situation of Stalin being so much wanting to be in control and so afraid of opposition that he killed off a lot of his military officers and put the others in jail made it much easier for Hitler to act uh, in the first uh, few years of, of the war because the, the Red Army was not in, in a good shape. That, on the other hand, saved Finland, uh, which was a good thing uh, historically. Uh, but uh, still, the one dictatorship made the other one possible. And, and this is something we must remember. They are the same the same type of background in thinking, even though the ideologies are, are, uh, are different. In order to have a society that functions and a society that we would like to live in and to defend, we need three legs. And that's human rights, it's democracy, and it's the rule of law. And, and without those three together, I mean, you can say, yeah, we had dem democratic elections. A lot of people have been democratically elected here and there, but it's not a real democracy if you don't have all three parts, human rights, rule of law, and, and democracy all together. And there, I come back to the victims of the crimes of, of the totalitarian regimes, those that are still alive, now living in the European Union, 
their human rights are still being violated when perpetrators are not taken to court. And this is an issue I have brought up with the FRA, the Fundamental Rights Agency of the European Union in Vienna. And hopefully they will investigate a little more into that uh, in the future because uh, it is a violation of, of the rights within the European Union that justice has not been made for those people. I was um, checking my Facebook in the telephone. It's easy to do that. Uh, it's, it's good with, with um, modern technology. And uh, there is a meeting with one of the committees of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Euro Europe going on. And there was a discussion there whether they should break the rules and throw out the representative from Greece who represents the new uh, national neo-Nazi party. They really discussed whether they sh should throw that person out. I, of course, wrote immediately that, that that's not the right thing to do. You have to use argument, you have to face the arguments, and you have to stand up. But that person must be able to sit according to the rules in the committee and, and make their terrible statements. But we have to meet it with, with arguments, not using the same methods that they do, because then our arguments get much weaker. So uh, my final message here today is that we must stand up for the <coughs> rights of the individual person in, in the nations. We must stand up for human rights, democracy and rule of law. And in order to do that, we must not forget history. And Mr. Chairman, I will not be any longer. I, instead, I hope we can have a lively discussion and I hope I have provoked a few people. Thank you, Joran Lindblad, for your interesting and insightful presentation and comments.